Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 4th. Today's topic is icebreakers and community building. Our special guest is Shelley Terrell. Her, your co-moderators today are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will introduce Shelley and ask her the newbie question. Well, welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you joining us for our kickoff webinar to the new school year. And we're always so excited to have the inspiring Shelley Terrell as our special guest presenter today to share some fantastic tips and tools for icebreakers and community building activities. And these could be used maybe with some site modification with both students and teachers. So I know you're going to have fun learning about them. We all know and love Shelley, but just for the record, I want to share a little bit about her. Shelley is an international speaker, e-learning and digital learning specialist, and the author of several books, including um, Hacking Digital Learning Strategies, Ten Ways to Launch, launch Ed Tech Missions in Your Classroom, The 30 Goals Challenge for Teachers, and uh, learning to go with tons of lesson ideas for teaching with mobile devices, cell phones, and BYOT. She has trained teachers and taught learners in over 20 countries. And she's been an invited guest expert by so many organizations. She's been recognized for tons of awards. And I've included all of those in our description on the website today. Um, she's also the founder and organizer of many online conferences, Twitter chats, MOOCs, and webinars. She was named the Woman of the Year by the National Association of Professional Women, and she was also awarded a BAMI Award as a founder of EdChat and named one of the 10 most influential people in EdTech by Tech and Learning. As you can see, she is an awesome person to be with us today to share her experiences and ideas for uh, community building. She also loves spending time with her adorable little girl, who is now 18 months old, little Savvy, who is probably the youngest interviewer of famous speakers at ISTE, which we all delight in listening to. So welcome, Shelley, and we'd love to know your thoughts about our newbie question today. So once you share your answer, you're free to take over the slides and to go on with your presentation. And here's our question for you. It's something I think that lots of teachers struggle with at the beginning of the year. Why do you think building relationships with students is such a high priority, starting with the first day of school? And how do you balance that with setting and teaching expectations for your classroom? Welcome, Shelley. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you have a good back to school. I think that building relationships is the key, um, the most important thing to do at the beginning of the school year. And one of the reasons why, well, that's actually what I discovered in my 20 years. Uh, <laughs> you know, now it's, it's going on that time of uh, being in the classroom, and um, it, it really helps with classroom uh, management, and that was something it took me a while to actually uh, discover. And the reason is because, um, and I think actually the building relationships part comes a little bit easier for most teachers than the um, having to set classroom expectations. I like the way that, um, I like the um, terminology expectations. What are, you know, what, what are the behavior expectations? Um, but by building relationships, um, when the students first see how much you care, and um, not only building relationships with teachers, uh, the teacher and the student, but also 
uh, relationship building between the students themselves. Um, if they, when we walk in the classroom, I like to say, hey, we are not a class, we are a community. And that's for every single class, even our online classes, um, that's what I do. And the reason why is because um, once they feel part of that community, then the community helps each other um, for everyone to be successful. And in my experience, that has really helped um, every student. It doesn't matter how far they've been behind or I've worked with uh, beginners, refugees, and, um, you know, the relationship really is what gets them to go the extra, to go beyond um, and to really push forward because they know someone believes in them. Um, and not only their teacher, um, you know, but they also have, um, you know, other peers within the classroom rooting for them and believing in them. And so with a huge team are really supporting them, then, um, and parents as well, it's, it's great to build relationships with parents at the beginning as well. Um, that's going to be the most, um, you know, building relationships is going to be the key to your success throughout the year. And uh, behavior expectations, uh, well, the classroom management, um, they were, they just, they tend to follow, um, you know, the, the expectations better because they want the whole, they realize, like, if they, um, if they do, then the whole community is benefited from it. And that's instead of just rules that you hand out that they didn't agree to or that they don't see the point in, uh, <laughs> then they, they if they see it in the realm of, we all need to succeed, and the best way to succeed is by, you know, respecting each other, being kind, um, and and so forth. Then they they tend to um, tend to follow it more, at least in my experience. So I'm going to go ahead and begin, and we can get uh, talk about some get to know you activities and icebreakers. Um, and also the way that I build community at the beginning of the year, because it's easy to say all of this, but it's good to have some real concrete examples and takeaways. Uh, definitely feel free to share um, any kind of ideas you have, any blog posts you have, um, ways that we can uh, contact you and, um, you know, follow you and everything on Twitter. I know Jerry's librarian. Um, I have a lot of really good friends in the chat right now, but I hadn't seen Jerry for a little while. So it's great to see him here and give him a huge hug. But he's been sharing some um, wonderful um, links to his pages that I know have tons and tons from a lot of different educators out there. So um, that's kind of the good thing about all of this because there's so many ways to build a community and um, there's so many different types of activities that then uh, before you leave the session, your, your big task is to decide <laughs> to narrow it down. So sometimes I'll have more than one that I do. Um, and this semester I get to do quite a few different ones because um, I actually took on a new position. I'm teaching in Houston, Texas, and I work for uh, now a STEM charter school. Um, and I love it. It's, a, it's really great. It's wonderful. And I have three years until my daughter gets to attend this school. So I've got three years to make it. You know, it's already a really wonderful staff and community, but I've got three years to make it the best one for my daughter, so um, it sounds, it, it, it's really exciting because I get to, uh, I, I know a lot of times teachers are like, oh, you know, they have, uh, there's this kind of disconnect there sometimes where it's like, oh my, you know, um, this is happening and that's happening and I don't really like it, but I, it's really exciting because now I get to be part of the change, so. Um, for me, that's like the best job in the world. <laughs> um, and I get to see my daughter uh, until she, you know, fifth grade, so that's awesome. Um, so with building community and get to know you activities, um, I'm going to go through kind of, um, you know, d different tasks you can do and then give you um, some information for even more ideas. Um, that I, I have tons of these, actually outlined in uh, my blog, so the best place um, to find a lot of them is if you go to shellychell.com slash icebreakers, or actually, um, 
the live binder that Peggy George has has been so awesome to really um, put together um, is actually at the point right now probably the back. It'll have the link to everything. But also my blog, I have a lot of these outlines, um, and even for. Uh, kindergarten, uh, first grade, second grade, you know, um, going for very, very young little children all the way to adults. So there's tons and tons that you can um, find. Some are digital and some are without technology. But a lot of them, I mean, all of them, the big point is to get your students to work as a team um, and as a community and to really help each other um, and that takes some time relationship building. So uh, right away, it's it's not going to happen. But the more that you do, and remember, um, uh, icebreakers can also be warmers and fillers, some of these. Um, these can also meet standards. These can um, also, you know, meet n not only technology standards, but reading, writing, literacy, math. I'm going to show you some math. Um, icebreakers as well and get to know your activities. And so you can keep doing these. These are not just um, you do them at the beginning of the, you know, the school or the classroom. I actually do these throughout. So um, you can use them as warmers and fillers as well um, or even as some ways to be able to, um, to, to be able to, um, you know, complete an activity as well. So icebreakers and get to know your activities, they encourage sharing. Um, they support collaboration. Um, and when you do have where each student gets to interact with each other and they get to know each other more, that really helps them um, to build, to see the value in each other. It gets them to see, you know, get to know the other person um, and see you know, what's what's going on in the inside and realize they're with a, another human being. And that is really extremely important even now uh, more than ever because so many times bullying is a result of being on our devices and machines and interacting with machines and devices and technology so much that our students really do forget that they're with another human being. And so if they're able to constantly um, be reminded of that and have that human interaction and and um, it really helps them. And there's a lot of research that shows this. So um, even more than ever, it's really great to have constantly uh, ways for them to get to know each other and have icebreakers. And the other part is it's healthy. Um, it's healthy for you and it's healthy for the students. It gets them moving. Um, it also gets you moving. But also it really helps um, with the mood in the classroom. I tend to see, you know, when, when the class, it, it's, it's really interesting because we tend to, it, in my, each of my classes we tend to get to know each other so well that it really feels um, you know, like we're a big family. Um, and that's happened time and time again in my classroom. And um, one of the reasons why is because, um, you know, I know, and it's not just me with the students, but all of us. And there's been just amazing, amazing things happen um, that I just think is incredible because of, um, because we do so much uh, community building and uh, focus on the relationships throughout. And so it's it's pretty powerful, the experience um, each year. Um, it becomes a lot more than teaching. So for you as a teacher, it's a great way to make sure that you're energized, excited, and you're not burning out. So the first part that's really um, important for community building is everyone needs to learn each other's names and how to pronounce them. That is really, really tough and hard. Um, I was actually making a joke with my sister. So I have four sisters, and two of them um, are teachers. So one is, a, so I'm in Texas, but one, I have a teacher, a sister who is a teacher in Texas. I mean, in um, New York, and I have a, in New York City. And I have another, um, and, she, and another one that's in California. And so, I just read that um, there was, uh, I don't know, I was looking up an actor and his uh, his son ha 
had a really interesting name. And um, so I was just <laughs> uh, commenting to my sister. I was like, wow, the rosters at the Hollywood uh, for the teachers must be very interesting. Um, <laughs> like Blue Ivy and North. And <laughs> it must be a really interesting uh, classroom there. So <laughs> I know learning names is getting more difficult than it ever because parents are super creative. Uh, not only with the names, but also the spelling of names. And so um, there are ways to be able to do this. And so I really get to test this more than ever now, um, these strategies. I've used them throughout, but now I have 650 students um, that I'll be seeing. And so um, learning names. Um, is definitely part of that. The, and we have a very diverse population. I think a lot of schools are like that now. So I think that um, when you do have your um, names, and so one thing that I've done, and you can um, you can use this link, it's a Google slide, but I'm, I'm actually doing this on Buncee. Um, is we create a class name dictionary. And so you can use this template. It's easy to edit and everything like that. Your students can edit it. You can just copy it. Um, and then in what students do is they take that slide. Um, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. But basically, they're putting in their name. They're spelling it out. And then they're putting in a video from the pronunciation, um, you know, pronunciation video of their name that they think is correct. Um, and then they get to share three symbols or three facts about them in their slides. So um, that's part of the template. This is the first page. And you can go to bit.ly slash name dictionary, um, all lowercase, and that should get you to the template. So uh, with this particular one, they have the slide. It looks like this. A is for, or whatever they're, they just changed the letter of whatever their first name is. They type the first name only. And uh, one of the reasons I only have them type in the first name and not first and last. And one of the reasons why they are not necessarily uh, putting in a, a picture of themselves is because um, to protect students, um, to make, make sure that, you know, it's uh, COBA compliant, FERPA. And so they're instead just doing three symbols. Um, so we're in a physical classroom, so we do get to see each other. You can use this for an online classroom. They can put a picture of themselves or a picture. Just be careful and make sure that, you know, if you do a name dictionary, um, make sure you get parents' permission before you publish anything. That's super important when you're working with 13 years old and younger. So that's and even, you know, in high school so, um, and adolescence, it's really good to, at, at all levels to get parent permission for digital chat. So um, this is, and then I show them, I always start off by showing them first my um, example. And this is what we are doing the first day of school. I'm also going to include a video, and it's going to have me, Savvy, and Roscoe in it saying hi um, to each of the grade levels. So that's what I'll be doing for that. Um, and here you can see my example that I'm going to be sharing with students. Of course, with mine, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, I'm Ms. Sanchez in the classroom, so it'll be um, SS4 and then Ms. Sanchez, and then um, it's for Shelly. Um, and so they, they get an example of the video, how to pronounce Shelly. And that the great thing about using Google Slides is with Google Slides, you can actually search for um, this particular video. So you you click on search the web and choose two images. But you can also, when you search the web, you can it tells them the instructions that um, search for your name pronounced from pronouncenames.com, and it automatically put 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 up this video. So that's really, really great. You may not know this about Google Slides, but Google Slides, um, if you do the search feature for images, it comes up with um, copyright friendly images um, so and Creative Commons images as well. 
um, when you look throughout Google Slides. So that's something to keep in mind, too. That really saves a lot of, you know, making sure that students use um, copyright-free um, and also they don't break copyright. And so it's great to use Google Slides, and that's why I have that as a template. Um, we start off with my, you know, my different images here. And they can put more than three if they want to. It's up to them. Um, so, and then we guess. So, what do you think some of these pictures mean? Um, you can see this picture here. If, if you don't know me, um, or even if you do, you can try and guess what these these different types of symbols um, mean for me. The world with the little airplane here. Um, I I think the first one you can kind of guess um, that it's you know, Savannah and Roscoe, <laughs> my two children here. Um, yes, it does. Okay, so Paula brought up a really, really great point. Thank you. Um, it says, uh, she says, uh, search within Google Slides also keeps the link attached to the picture. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and then here, this is, uh, so if you've ever been to ISTE in San Antonio, you might recognize this because this is the Riverwalk, and I'm originally born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. So my students, that'll I'll be sharing that with them. The fact that I'm an author, um, so I like to let my students know. Um, we have a very diverse population. I think it's really um, important that my students know I strive for dreams. Um, there are things that I'm constantly trying to do, so that way, I find that my students um, really like knowing that about me, um, that I'm a writer and that I, 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 I teach them and they love it. They, they tend to love it. I've actually had students ask for my books, um, but um, I'm always telling them, well, you know, I have to really publish. I have a poetry book I want to publish for Savvy soon, and then I think, you know, that will be better for students. <laughs> um, I always tell them, oh, it's for teachers. <laughs> um, and then here, it's because I've been to over 20 countries, and I've taught and lived in, in different countries as well. And the students love that. So um, it's, it's great because they have someone in their classroom um, that, you know, comes from their area in Texas. And, um, has been able to do these things, so it's good for them to strive and let them know um, they can do it as well. So when they fill out there, they can present it as well. Um, if you have a lot of students, so I have about um, 30 in the classroom out of, you know, the 650 I'll see throughout the week. Um, I have about 30 in the classroom, I give or take, you know. And so maybe a little bit more in some. So what what... Now, obviously, I only have 45 minutes, and um, many of you the same thing, or an hour, or maybe you have 90 minutes, but it'd be really difficult for 30 students to be able to, um, it'd be really, really uh, difficult for each of them to be able to present this. So instead what we do is um, we do something called mingling or working in pairs, and, what they, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that um, in a little bit, but Basically, what that means is that they share their name dictionary um, with a partner, and then um, I have a timer, an egg timer, and then, you know, after talking with each other and guessing what each picture means, a conversation for about a minute or two, the timer will, it will ring, and then they do it again and meet somebody else. So we just keep doing that every two minutes. Um, they're basically introducing themselves and listening to their friend introduce themselves um, with their different slides. So this is um, how we do it. To, so that way we can get to know quite a few of our classmates, maybe, you know, five of them within that time. Um, it keeps the juices, you know, because they're they're moving from person to person. And they get to know each other. And they really love the, that. Um, the other thing that they do while they're introducing themselves and they're doing this is they clap their name with a peer. So this is with TPR. You may have heard total physical response. And um, that 
is by Dr. James Asher, but what he says is basically that if you're um, learning and you're also tying physical movement to your learning, then you will, then the brain will remember this much easier and that it's just brain friendly. It's a great way for us to learn. Even babies, so even with Savannah, we use a lot of TPR because that's really part of their development and in their development of language. Uh, so for us to remember, we actually clap our names, the syllables, like, you know, and it's any type of clap, it's just, you know, they put their hands together, and then it's S-H-E-L-L, -L, you know, Y for Shelly, and so that's the way um, they have that um, as well. Um, and so when they can switch with a partner and the same thing, and that's going to help us to remember their names. Um, as well and help each other. And that helps us to also get to pronounce each other's names too. And then I'm going to have some other icebreakers in a little bit where everybody knows each other. So I guess that was a question that was in the chat box that um, uh, suggestions for icebreakers for activities in very small schools uh, where everyone gets to know each everyone else. Yes, absolutely. Well, the great thing is that if you know each other, um, those three, um, then the three pictures and the three symbols, that gets people to know a little bit more about you. Um, or it, it makes it even more fun, or there's three truths and a lie, you know, which, which of these pictures shows two truths or something like that. <laughs> Um, the, okay, for very, very young learners, so I've worked with two-year-olds in the classroom before when I was teaching in Germany. And, um, and with the little kids, you can also do different types of names and games in TPR. So in this case, um, we all sit around in a circle. And then we have a little ball, like the one that's in um, the little boy is carrying. <laughs> and then we, when the, you know, one one person has a ball, um, and we all get together and um, he, they clap, they, they, they do their name, hi, my name is, and then they um, pat on the ball for each syllable. So Shelly would be two pats. And then we all say, hi, Shelly, nice to meet you. Um, and then we roll it on to somebody else. And uh, my two-year-olds could do that. They loved it. It was a really fun game. Um, and you could do it with, you know, even kindergarten, that could be like a nice little um, introduction and hello as well. Um, you can find a lot of different, um, a lot of different um, ideas about learning each other's names, more and more ideas and activities. Um, a, a page where I put the link inside the chat box, but you can go to, a uh, blog that is com slash author slash Shelly Terrell and see all my articles there, including this one as well. You'd have to scroll a little bit down because you, um, it's, you know, I, I wrote it in August of last year. The next thing we do after, you know, knowing names in, uh, is also is seeing each other's vision boards. And so that's been something I've done for the last two years with my learners. Um, digitally. So before what we used to do is we used to make a collage of them. And I wrote about this in my book like, I don't know, six years ago or something in the 30 Goals Challenge for Teachers. So if you happen to have read that book, then this is something that I've had um, for a very long time for students to do. And the reason why is I was inspired in 2007, there is actually um, a book called The Secret, um, Oprah Winfrey had put it out and, uh, you know, I always looked at Oprah's uh, suggestions. And so vision boards are what very um, accomplished people swear by. And what it is is that you usually have a collage in your room and what you do is you put, um, you know, different pictures. You can put, uh, you know, my students used to love cutting up the magazines and, and putting up quotes that, you know, famous quotes from people. Um, you know, different images that they saw that they thought, you know, really represented their dreams, um, you know, what they want to accomplish in life. And then I tied also their learning goals, what they want to achieve, not just in my classroom, but in general in the school and any of the classes, uh, whether it be, you know, some, a lot of them usually put grades or 
uh, puts, uh, you know, different other types of goals as well. And so this is, so then I started making a digital version because I love Buncee and Buncee is a really great way to be able to do this. My students love Buncee. And so I'm going to show you what it looks like, um, their examples. But you can do this with your students using a, a lot of different free web tools. Here are a few options. Um, Buncee I have up there, it makes it so simple to do it with Buncee and Quip. Um, and they can just get a login, so that's why I do it. And there is a free version of Buncee. But Canva is another way to do it. Google Slides or Google Draw, if you use Google. Pick Collage, uh, S'more, Edugogster, Vision CC. I didn't put Padlet, but you can do it with Padlet only because you only get uh, three now. So um, if the student happens to have an account, then that makes it a little bit easier, then they can make their own three tablets. But um, that's another way to accomplish this. Now let's see what it looks like. So this is actually my students, um, what it looks like. So I actually have a template. And this year, I made it different. So my students this past year, they um, created their vision boards with, um, with the one word project. So at the top they choose one word and uh let's see here. Let's see if I can oh there it is. Okay. So you you can hopefully see where it says, you know, the word happiness and um oh here we go. Okay. So right here we have, you know, the one word that they put and then they put synonyms to go with it. Um, and then they, they put someone um, that inspires that one word. Okay, so here is one example from one of my students um, using Budsy. They use the template, so I have the template. Um, here is another example from a student. They can change the background. Um, and so on the right side, they're putting quotes or inspirational videos or inspirational images. Um, and then, and the great thing is on in, in Buncee, you can also search for videos. You can also search for, um, they have stick, stock images that are copyright friendly from Pixabay. Um, so it's it's really nice. I like using Buncee too because, uh, or Google Slides for this because, or even Canva because, it's easy to search for images and include them, and it'd be, you know, respect copyright. They shared also then the next slide is, this is like the next slide. They're sharing the personal goals, and then the uh, the last slide is, um, so it's like three or four slides, I, I think now. And what they do is they share their personal and academic goals. So this is, once again, a uh, student of mine. They can change the background any way they want. They get to choose the videos, everything like that. I love them. I think they do such a good job. Here's another example. My one word is determination. Um, they're showing pictures of their fathers. Who exemplifies this to me? My dad. Um, and then they add, it's funny because I don't ask them to do any of this. Um, I mean, I, I they have to put the one word. They have to put the synonym and then someone who exemplifies this. But the rest is all whatever they want. And so they they get really inspired and they love doing this. Um, here's another, you know, of the academic goals. This one decided to use inspirational quotes instead of the actual videos. Um, this is graded with a rubric. And what it is is it's because I want to inspire them to put, you know, them. So I basically, with the rubric, is just kind of checked, you know. So here I might have taken some points out just because they didn't put the, the person that it was the quotes. And they're always welcome to correct it, and they're always welcome to go back and, you know, make those changes um, as well. So that's an idea of some of the vision boards. What we do is, and I think that was really um, important, um, Jerry Cyberian Manwag, who's great too. Uh, did share, uh, you know, how he got them to revisit ghosts throughout the year. So the great part, and that's the best part, um, you know, of the vision board of how it ties to success, um, and really incredibly accomplished people that we look up to use vision boards. Even, for example, like Beyonce, she's one of the most famous ones who does this. And, and the, the idea is you have to keep 
going back to revisit. So uh, Jerry says he has students go back and revisit often or had them. And so that is key point. And the way that we revisit this, because a collage is a physical collage, you wake up every day and it's there. But a digital board, not so much. <laughs> Unless you say it as a desktop or something, I guess. I don't know. but um, Or a wallpaper. But um, what they can do is, I have them do an actual writing journal, and so in their journals uh, once a week, um, they actually uh, reflect, or every two weeks actually, they reflect back on their one word and their vision board, and that's always one of the journal entries. How how are you, you know, um, you know, how are you, you, how did you see examples of your one word in action this past two weeks, um, you know, and how are you continuing your goals? You know, which which of your academic goals, what did you do this past two weeks that really, you know, um, for one of your academic or personal goals? And so that's how I get them to constantly revisit this. And now to get uh, some math-based get-to-know-you activities um, you can, um, that you can use within the classroom as well. And so here's me by the numbers. You do this once again with any of these tools. Um, I tend to use Bunsy, Google Slides, those are my two bulletin tools. Um, but basically, students introduce themselves. It's the same idea. And we get to know each other by the numbers. So this could be something if everyone knows each other. They may not know, you know, specific facts about themselves uh, based on numbers. And so this is just getting it to be where math um, is very tangible. They see that it's in the real world and that they can just make those connections. Um, and, and also, it's a great way to, you know, start off with a fun task. And so they, they can choose. So I give them a bunch of categories, and I let them choose five. Um, three to five, depending, you know, how much time we have and everything like that. But um, they have to choose. And the reason why they get to choose which numbers um, that they want um, to use and me by the numbers is because some students aren't going to be um, comfortable sharing, you know, their height. Um, or And especially with adolescents and, um, you know, teens, they, they get a little self-conscious about certain things. So, um it's great to be able to give them a choice. That way they're uh, so more comfortable uh, with what they want to share, whether it be their birthday, their shoe size, their number of pets or siblings, or any kind of other number they can think of um, to help them describe themselves as well. So I think that they would really enjoy that um, as well. And they can do interesting things. Tell them to think of an interesting number like, for example, you know, a collection, you know, something about a, a collection. When I was growing up, I used to have um, over, I over like, 52 hippos. Um, and they were figurines. I was just in love with hippos, uh, drawings, paintings, uh, even the fian, uh, fiance ones. And so that would have been an interesting number back for me. There's a 3 to one introduction, so um, three facts to favorite either places or foods or um, um, color, you know, whatever you want, um, and then one dream job. It's just a 3 to one so you can change that um, how you want. And students can accomplish this in so many ways. Um, and I feel like students accomplish this in, you know, in comic forms or, you know, different types of presentation apps, just a lot of different ways. Um, and then here's my example. Um, this is just of the three facts to start off with, and then I have the two and then the one. Um, and I always use my examples um, so they get to know me as well. But these are some from some of the other um, teachers who have taken my online courses and who have participated, they, if you've taken an online course with me, then you have to, um, then you usually will accomplish a task like this. So I know some of you have probably done this quite a bit if <laughs> you've taken um, any kind of online training with me that's extended period of time. And so 
some of these might actually be your examples, but you can see the different tools used here. There are videos, there's um, Haiku Deck, there's um, Storybird, there's a comic creator here. So there are tons of ways that you can accomplish this. So we talked a little about mingling. Mingling, how many of you are familiar with four square? So, I mean, um, square dancing. So in Texas, you know, places like this, um, I guess more like cowboy kind of areas. Anyway, so we do have square dancing. In fact, in our elementary schools when I was growing up, um, that was one of our um, subjects where we <laughs> got to be in music and, and it's, um, you know, so that's what mingling is like. What mingling is like you meet someone and in 30 seconds you share um, or a minute or two minutes and then the timer goes off, you run and you do the same task uh, basically or have the same kind of conversation, of course, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be different for each one. Um, and for the next two minutes, and then again, um, the bell rings or the egg time rings, and then they switch to another partner. And so they're, that's the way mingling is. Sometimes mingling isn't timed. Um, a lot of times it isn't. And then mingling is just that you get different people you get to have conversations with. Um, like if you were at a cocktail party or something like that. Um, then, or a conference, you know, you'll, you, you'll mingle and kind of go around the room and have little conversations, not just with one person. And so that really gets you to get to know each other, um, and, and also get some moving and active as well. So you might think of this as well with uh, bingo. Um, a lot of times that's what bingo looks like because they have to get each other's names and, and different names for each category. Um, so an adaption I've made for very young learners is toy bingo. Basically, you can bring in a bunch of toys um, that are there. And then um, each student has a toy. They pair students. Um, they start the timer, um, and the children basically they just play. They just play with the toys in front of them, and then they move on to the next kind of toy set, and they play, you know, or different partners, and they play with them. Students get to learn so much through pit play. Um, it's really uh, important for the development. Um, that's one of the best ways for them to be able to develop those social skills. So it's it's important. So play is definitely part of that. I have some um, mingle activities with QR codes. So basically, one student gets a red QR code, and the other, and I'll be using this activity in um, starting August twenty second. Although I start this Monday. Um, but and the training and everything, but at 10th I meet parents and the 22nd, when they come in, they'll be uh, using this. So what it is is what they do here is that um, one of them has the joke, one of them has the, um, they match the joke and pun. So there's actually four that I use. Uh, one is about a king or this, the king keep his army. Another one is about a cow where the cows go on Saturday night. Um, it's really silly, but uh, students love it. There's another reason behind this as well. Um, a lot of uh, uh, students don't get to know what a QR code, I mean, they've seen these QR codes, but they've never really scanned one, or they've never used that technology before. And since we're going to be using that in the classroom, it's a great way to kind of get them to, um, I can show them really quick here. You know, so when they walk in, they just see my, I have an iPad, my own iPad and my own, um, you know, mobile device that they, that I have set up in the classroom. So when they walk in, they just get their paper, they scan it, um, it's text, so they don't need the internet. So you might not know that about uh, QR codes, but you don't need the inter an internet connection. And then they try to find their partner who, you know, so if one is about a king, um, or uh, if maybe you can guess the one about the cows. So where do cows go on Saturday night? Um, and we'll see if someone can type the answer in the chat box. And so they get to know each other because um, I also tell them, you know, you have to know each other's, you know, introduce yourselves, say your name, and then ask your, you know, them, you know, this is my QR code. What does yours say? And and basically that. So. 
Nobody has answered my joke about the where the cows go on Saturday night. <laughs> I'll give you a few more a second. So this is where uh, Bingo, uh, exactly, the movies. Way to go, Patty. <laughs> so, um, yes, definitely, Doug is headed to the movie. <laughs> so um, for that, if you if you two um, email me, I Shelly Carroll, I'll give you one of my um, books for free. And the, the, let's see, okay gmail.com. There we go. There's my thing there. They can, I can give you a copy of Learning to Go that has um, that joke activity it has where you can print them out. Um, and then there's Digital Bingo as well. You can edit this template as well. I have one for students. I have one for um, teachers as well. But what you do is um, it gets them familiar with what they've done already with technology. So I'm a technology teacher reflecting on their use of technology is part of what I uh, do as well. Um, there's mobile show and tell. So basically students get together. Um, if they're using a mobile device, they just show a picture that they've already taken from the mobile device and talk about it. They, they talk about, you know, why it's important or where they took it. Um, and so forth and so forth. They, and you can do this, they can do this also with a, um, if they don't, if you don't have technology, the way that we do this without technology is they take a personal item, either, you know, an eraser or something on them, a uh, pouch that they like or, and it's a great way because a lot of them got new supplies, whether it's, you know, a new sticker or a notebook or, um, or they have earrings or something personal, pen, a favorite pen or something, and then they, they talk about it, you know, where they got it, why they like it, and so there is the non-tech version as well. I need to wrap up soon, so <laughs> sorry about that. I don't know. Um, can you see the slides okay? I don't know if I, I so messed with the slide here, I think. Uh-oh, what do you do here? <laughs> Okay, I think we're back to normal. Some more icebreakers. Toilet paper web intro. Um, this is a way to be able to um, get students together and realize. So a lot of some of the activities I do as a technology teacher is to get my students off to realize that online um, that we're a community as well, and that every time they post online, they're part of the digital community. A big world, and then we talk about, you know, www. Why is it called World Wide Web? What do we think of when we think of web? You know, what do we think of when we think of a worldwide? What, and they'll say different things like spiders. And so this is a physical part of, you know, what they do digitally. So basically, I take the first sheet. I introduce myself where I was. Um, they have to say where they were born and raised. Um, you know, because a lot of times there's a, a, a students from different places even within. So if we're in Houston, they could be from different parts of Houston. Or we might have some that are from, um, you know, different countries and things like that too. So I say my name. I basically say a fun fact where I'm from or where I was born and in, in, in lived for a bit. And then I throw the piece of paper while still holding on to somebody else. And they do the same. Hi, my name is, you know, um, Peggy George. I am from Arizona. And then, you know, a fun fact about Peggy, it was just recently her birthday, so happy belated birthday, Peggy. And um, and then she throws it to the next person. Hi, I'm Paul Knuckle, and uh, I'm in, you know, <laughs> Louisiana. And then Jerry, I'm in Florida, and so on. And we get to know each other. <laughs> And then what we do is that we're able to, um, I tell them, okay, so what does this look like? We talk about the web, and we talk about how their actions um, impact everyone. Um, so the people across the world that they may not even see um, are impacted by anything they like, um, because that shows up in the news feed. Anything um, they retweet, they're, ret you know, um, resharing that that's a message, uh, any visual, anything like that, that all of it, makes an impact to someone around the world um, and lots of people around the world because they always have an audience. So then we talk about, you know, how can we make the world a better place um, by our digital actions, by being responsible and just keeping in mind what we do online. 
we also talk about the fact how when you do get online, part of the first steps is introducing yourself, you know, and it takes that quick. It's as quick as, you know, me throwing to somebody else, you know, in a way, um, and then having um, them connect with me. When I connect with somebody else, they are going to want to know about me, some, like, quick facts. They're going to see my profile. Um, and then we talk about, you know, uh, being a digital citizen and how we introduce ourselves and all of that good stuff. So it leads to good conversations about digital use. Some emoji ones that are really, really fun. Um, here's one um, using emojis to answer the following. And then you have your current mood, your pets, um, you know, favorite color. And then they just use emojis. And then they have a conversation and try to guess, oh, you have a cat and you have a dog, if there was like a little cat. And, oh, what kind of dog? Well, you know, I have a pug. His name is Roscoe. Um, and then we, you know, continue. Oh, your favorite is sushi. I love sushi, too. Or pizza, <laughs> you know. When was the last time you had sushi? When was the last time you had pizza? Um, here's a wonderful template. Um, I call it the Museum of Me. I have this on slides uh, by David Lee at Tech. He has provided um, a really cool, awesome template on Google Slides. I've adapted a bit. And then Buncee created this one, as, um, you know, or I created this one in Buncee, so it looks like this. And students um, have a museum, and they have different exhibits. So one of their family, talents, culture. Um, they can have pictures, videos, just, uh, you know, fun facts, things like that. There's the epic selfie adventure, uh, which I also have templates for. So I make a lot of templates that teachers can easily use and adapt, or the students as well, um, because this is what my students do. So, you know, it, I I like sharing whatever um, I do throughout the year if it helps somebody else. Um, because I appreciate what people um, share all the time online and the community is so good about that. So um, you decide the challenges that they have to accomplish. Um, and here are a few ideas, like um, they can do one with a hobby or a talent, um, a book, a hero, a pet, a sibling, um, um, a favorite place or book that they've traveled. This is really good, a selfie adventure, because um, instead of something in the summer, you know, um, and I was reading about this the other day that if we ask them about their summer, some of them may have not been able to do much. Um, maybe they stayed at home a lot or something. So it gets them to go out and have this adventure. If it's very young learners and you want to protect their identity, instead they would have a toy and they would create um, a selfie adventure of the toy and then write the digital story that goes along with that. And it's their favorite toy or just one of the toys they have around the house, they can do that. Or you can provide one. You can provide something like a flat standing or something like that. Ball q and toss, so it's just having a small ball. Um, this is a great way to review and reflect as well, just answer, you know, after having like a discussion or something just to make sure that they recap. Um, and I always give the options, so if you can't answer, because we don't want to put students in a uh, spot too much. They can always ask a peer and pass along. It's okay if they don't know the answer, just pass it along to another peer who does. Um, I keep doing this with the slides <laughs> where I just keep making it bigger. And then we have a ball icebreakers and the same idea where they have a ball, um, except you add stickers uh, or you can even add uh, masking tape, and then you write down, like, different icebreaker questions. You know, what are the three things you would take to a deserted island? Uh, what is, you know, the one place you always wanted to travel? You know, what's your favorite book? Things like that. When they, you roll the ball or you throw the ball wherever they touch, that's the question they answer. And then so forth and so forth. Um, the other is, uh, for example, um, this one's really easy with masking tape. So you just put the tape on the floor. This one I was in Brazil training teachers. And so we put it on the floor, the masking tape. And then this is a yes and no line or pro and con line. So you jump to the left if your favorite, um, if chocolate is your favorite type of ice cream. Um, jump to the right if it's something else. Then they turn. And they have a discussion a little bit. Oh, what is your favorite type of ice cream if it's not chocolate? You can do this with issues as well. All right. And this gets a little bit heated, so just FYI. Um, right. You might want to try topics at the beginning that are not so uh, loaded. So things like um, are heated topics, but, um, you know, that 
aren't like that. And so what you can do is things like dress code. Dress code is a pretty good one. You know, um, who what makes a better pet, cats or dogs? So those aren't, you know, going to get us in uh, students too heated uh, to a discussion. Um, I got this one from Terry Eccles. I love her blog, uh, EngageYourMinds.com. She's a fellow educator in Texas. She just started a new STEM position, too. So her and I will be collaborating. But she came up with this really cool infographic, which is called Me, the User Manual. And it has different uh, images. It has uh, my style, interests. What people misunderstand about me is my favorite um, category. So I think that's wonderful. And that's it. So those were the ideas. I hope you have uh, uh, quite a few to be able to help you uh, build a community, develop relationships um, among each other, and have a really wonderful, incredible back to school year. And I'll answer any questions or let Peggy come on and, and or Lori. Um, and help moderate. Thank you for sharing in the chat box so many great ideas and suggestions. Thanks so much, Shelley. Um, I think everybody learned a great deal about uh, how to do a better job at, at starting the school year. Um, the questions that I managed to capture, you've already answered. OK, great. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody else has questions for Shelley, please Please type them in chat, and she'll ask them now. Or if you want to get on the mic, we can do it that way, too. You'd have to raise your hand to get on the mic. Yeah, and you did a wonderful can... job at that. Yep, Peggy. Where's Roscoe? And his baby sister, Savannah, <laughs> His uh, daddy, Jake, just took him to the uh, Pet Mart where he's getting groomed. <laughs> he's having a spa day. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to the form. So I just created a new digital book and stuff. So if you fill out this form, um, then it makes it easier for me to send you a copy of that for anyone who wants a copy of some of the digital activities. It, I have a new digital book that I'm working on, um, and it does have like comics and infographics, and um, it has rubrics for that too. So, there is a, a new question, Shelley. Have you had experiences with teachers who object to wasting time on icebreakers? Absolutely, that's a really good question. So, <laughs> Twitter is is funny. Um, so, a lot of people actually were just talking about this. There was a huge Twitter conversation about what a waste of time and how it's so uncomfortable and for introverts it's really bad. I, you would be very surprised, um, am, am very introverted, um, although I don't seem that way. But the, the, right now the skills, uh, it's so important even for introverts. And I've had really shy students who don't talk throughout the year. <laughs> um, but. The, the, it's so important um, to have these because they really develop um, they they develop these social skills that is more than um, necessary. They get to learn how to interact with um, each other and that human element. And so I think the relationship building, the human element, and taking you out of your comfort zone. I've had um, the selfie one, especially. I've had teachers and students who do not want to do it, well, mostly teachers uh, at some point. And um, I remember having uh, um, one particular teacher in Venezuela when I was traveling around the country. And she was so, um, did not, and then I said, well, you know, that's kind of part of participating. And so just step out of your comfort zone, go meet people, get, you know, and kind of walk her through it. And at the end, she came up to me in tears. And I mean, I've never had anyone for that. And she said, thank you so much, because this really got me to get out of my comfort zone, to really um, get to know people, and to really just kind of see myself in a, a new way. Um, because you know, just taking selfies is so much about your self-esteem. And she was, she just, you know, didn't, was really uncomfortable with that. But our students are posting pictures and doing all these things. Um, so I've always seen that it's really helped them grow. And so um, I, I tell teachers a lot of times, too, that, if, you know, it's good participation karma. 
if you want our students to participate throughout, you know, we need to kind of be that model and example and, and try to do these as well. Sure. Thanks. Any other questions for Shelley? Well, thank you so much. <laughs> um, once again, I'll put the the link in there. And if you have any more questions, you can always uh, contact me. Twitter's always the best at Shelly Terrell, but you can email me Shelly Terrell at gmail dot com and answer questions that way as well. So I'm always online. <laughs> again, thanks so much, Shelly. I'm going to well, turn the mic. Thank you all, and I had a great time. <laughs> have a great back to school. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy now. Thank you so much, Shelley. That was fantastic. We're going to just quickly wrap up. There's something I want you all to know about. Either if you're a Donors Choose user or, or if you have teachers at your school who maybe have thought about it but haven't tried it out. We had Francie Kugelman on our show last year sometime, and she did a great webinar on all kinds of tips to get donors choose uh, funding. And she wanted me to share this with you, because if you've never submitted a donors choose project, or if you have teachers who haven't, there is a great bonus going on right now between tomorrow, August 5th, and August 10th. And you will receive an automatic $50 donation from Donors Choose. And in addition, she's going to give you an additional $25 donation to your first project. And I put these um, links in the live binder so you can go back to them and see them. But she's going to give you an additional 25 So that will give you $75, $80 before you even get started. So please share this with your teachers. You can even print out that that um, page if you want to. Uh, it's an image in the live binder. And let's see if we can get some of our some of our teachers funded for some of these great donors choose oppor choose opportunities. And also, we do, we are back, and we are having a show each Saturday. We don't have our um, guests finalized for next Saturday, but the following Saturday we're going to have Sharon Davison, who is an awesome ambassador for Global Goals, and she's going to share some specific things about teaching Global Goals in kindergarten. And then, um, as you can see, we're just gearing back up and filling in our schedule. But we do want to let you know we won't have a show on September 1st, which is Labor Day weekend in the United States. So thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope you'll come back next Saturday. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargett on Slavist. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a Collaborate session. And as long as your session is open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site or from within the Live Finder. Uh, you can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection of recordings is available on iTunes U and also on YouTube. So there are many places you can get to recorded sessions. When you exit the session, the survey should open. And at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate. And thanks to Patty Ruffing for sending these out. And also thanks to Patty, your name prints out on the certificate. Again, when you exit the session, the survey link should automatically open in your browser. If not, you can take it from the chat box or from within the Live Finder. This is the direct link. 
Special thanks again to Shelley Terrell, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.